Thank you everyone for joining us here tonight for our first session in this exciting series, uh, Learning from the New Normal. Before we start, as we still find ourselves in the midst of a health crisis, I want to acknowledge that while we're here together to learn as a collective, our thoughts and our prayers are with those who are struggling due to the COVID-19 pandemic. For all those whose health and the health of their loved ones has been impacted by COVID-19, we wish them a speedy and a full recovery. Broadly speaking, tonight's talks are about impact. Over the next hour, you'll hear some thoughts about the impact of this pandemic from a variety of perspectives or layers. The goal is to help us consider together the different ways that COVID-19 has impacted our lives from a global perspective down to each individual. My name is Morty Sabetti and I currently serve as the executive director here at BAS. My background is in education, mathematics and technology and I've been part of the school community here since 2013. Mrs. Rina Deutsch is one of our superstar Judaic studies teachers at Opana. Outside school, she tells me that she can be found at home with her husband and five children, posting Divrei Torah and Chizuk online. And as a parent, like many of us, she feels she's always trying to actually finish the never ending stream of laundry in her home. She'll be speaking tonight about the impact of COVID-19 from a community perspective. Finally, Mr. Tani Reese is our exceptional school social worker at Ulpana, at, at Orchaim, excuse me. Tani has a background in youth justice and adolescent mental health support. And tonight he will be speaking with us about the impact of the pandemic on the individual level. To get things started tonight, I wanna to speak with you broadly about the role of data in our individual and our collective efforts to make sense of what's going on around us. Since the start of the pandemic, we've been inundated with numbers, health statistics and other markers that are really meant to help us understand the nature of this public health crisis that we're in. We receive daily reports through government officials, news outlets and social media as well on case counts from a variety of formats. I personally love numbers. Everyone who knows me knows that, but like many others, I sometimes found the sheer volume of that data that's been shared to be overwhelming and at times challenging to digest. But collectively, we keep looking for these numbers. We keep checking to see how many new cases there were today. So we can start with a very simple question. Why do we crave data during a pandemic? I think there are two related explanations for this. First, we're simply looking for some certainty during an otherwise incredibly uncertain time. And exact figures give us a sense of certainty. Knowing that there were exactly 781 new cases makes us feel better informed than simply knowing that there were a lot of cases. Second, we believe that data is what we call a tangible proxy into what's happening in the world, what's actually happening in the world. With so many unknowns, knowing something makes us feel like we better understand the situation that's going on around us. And indeed, we can, we can count cases fairly accurately and be confident in the numbers that we're seeing. A number is something that we can, we can hold in our minds and feel like we actually have it. These two ideas are, of course, related. And I think you can tell by my use of quotations and the tone of my voice that even though data is a way for us to stay informed and experience some certainty, it's by no means without its challenges. And tonight we're going to try to uncover some of those challenges together. With that, there are two interrelated big ideas about data that I want to share with you tonight. The data that we select matters and how we represent that, matter, that data to others also matters. Let's start together with a non-pandemic example. During World War II, the British found that they were losing a lot of their fighter planes in battle. They were eager to do something about it, so they decided that they would add a small amount of armor onto the planes. But because they can't add an, an infinite amount of armor onto the plane due to weight restrictions, they had a decision to make. 
where should that armor on the plane go? To answer that question, they decided that they were going to very simply collect some data. So each time a plane came back from battle, they plotted on the diagram bullet holes that they observed on that representation of the plane. And this is what they saw. Okay, so every time a plane came back, they plotted a dot, a black dot onto the diagram. And this is the image that they saw in the end. So where should the armor go is the question. This is from a book on visual reasoning, but there's an important message here about the data that we select. After looking at this diagram carefully, they decided to add more armor here and here, illustrated in red. Because the planes that they were getting their data from were the ones that came back, not the ones that were lost in battle, this is where they decided to put their extra armor. So the areas that were not showing up on the diagram were the ones that really mattered. From a COVID perspective, selection really matters. And there's a lot of data at our disposal, perhaps more than ever. Instead of just sharing daily case counts, health officials have also been sharing other information, such as case characteristics, who's getting sick and where are they? What the type of spread is like? Is it an outbreak or is it an isolated case or a number of isolated cases? They can also share information about severity, about the positive cases of those positive cases, how many people are, are losing their lives or otherwise in serious medical condition. They can also share percent positivity, which is another commonly used proxy for trying to make sense of what's going on. Instead of looking at the number of positive cases, uh, which is one measure that's very commonly used and reported, but also related to the number of tests that's actually being done, to the amount of testing that's being done, percent positivity looks at what percentage of daily tests were actually positive. But as we hinted together earlier, the selection, all of those great things that we can collect are not without their challenges. They all come with, with particular nuances that we need to try to tease out. For example, with, with respect to the COVID data that's being collected, what about those that are COVID positive but not showing symptoms, those that are asymptomatic? What about those that simply choose not to be tested? What about errors in the tests themselves, such as false positives or false negatives? And of course, what about delays in testing, which could impact the data that we see? Importantly, since most of us are not collecting our own data and we rely on others to present that data for us and to us, this is where this idea of representation really becomes essential. To illustrate that, let's go back 165 years ago to a different health crisis. Let's go back to a cholera pandemic in London, 1854. Here, a person named John, Dr. John Snow, a physician, is starting to suspect that a cholera outbreak is connected to the drinking water in London. To try to make sense of that, Dr. Snow decided to take a map of London and to plot onto that map the homes of all of those people who lost their lives to cholera during that epidemic. Next, what he did was he added the wells onto the map. Now, th this map is from uh, 165 years ago, so it might be difficult to see. So I added little red circles around the wells. So hopefully a little bit easier to visualize those wells now. So he plotted those wells, made them nice and clear. And based on where those wells were and based on where the representations were of the people that, that died due to the cholera epidemic, he saw very, very clearly, it became clear to him that many of the cases were clustered around a single well in the center of the map. Now, it might be hard for you to see it over the Zoom and over the screen share that I'm, that I'm doing with you here, but it's, it's very uh, uh, visually apparent from the map itself. Now, the Governing Council of London had the addresses, we know of all the people who had died from cholera, but it was with this map that Dr. Snow was able to convince them to close down that one problematic pump, 
to close down the Broad Street pump. This example illustrates for us that selecting the data is important. It matters what data we choose, but the way that we represent that data is essential for our understanding and can be incredibly powerful at conveying meaning to others and controlling the meaning that's being represented. If we fast forward to today, okay, let's move from 165 years ago to now, we have incredible technology at our disposal to present data in incredibly creative and thought-provoking ways. In the example that I'm showing here, John Hopkins University maintains so-called heat maps that show various types of case data plotted worldwide. The graphic that's up on the, on the slide now shows the total cases of COVID-19 throughout the world. Essentially, the more red you see, the more cases there are in those areas. So if you look at North America, for example, it looks like it's almost entirely, uh, excuse me, if you look at the United States, it looks like it's entirely, almost entirely covered in red. If you look at other parts of the world, there are also clusters of red there as well, significant clusters in certain places. Now I want you to compare this map with the following. This map shows the fatality rate for COVID cases throughout the world. If we flip back and forth, and I'll go back a couple of times, you can see that there are differences between the two, but certainly similarities that are there. If you focus just on North America, and in particular on the United States, it clearly stands out in terms of total cases, but the fatality rate shows different areas of the world with a more striking number of these white dots. So if I go back, again, focusing just on the United States, which is hopefully somewhere that everybody can pick out on a map pretty easily, uh, it, it looks like it's almost entirely covered in red. But if I flip to um, the image that shows the case fatality ratio, meaning the relationship between the number of cases and the actual number of deaths, the two are not one in the same at all. And there are, there are places in the world that have a higher concentration of those white dots as opposed to the higher concentration of the red dots. This representation, these representations taken together can serve to do a few things. They can direct our thinking and, and serve as a powerful medium to communicate, especially if these are compared with data presented in a different way. For example, if data were represented in a large table as opposed to these visual representations. So it's, it's a great time now to pause and ask the most important question. Um, so what? <laughs> um, you know, so what does this mean for us as people who are trying our best? And, and really, if there's one phrase I can use to describe what we're all doing right now in 2020, we are all trying our best. Um, and in this case, for the purposes of this short talk, we're trying our best to make, our, make sense of what's going on around us and specifically all of these numbers that we're being bombarded with on a daily basis. For me, this starts with a recognition that our experience of what's going on around us is shaped by who we are, what we believe, whether we slept well last night, and whether the person ahead of us at Starbucks just paid for our coffee, socially distant, of course. Staying with the coffee theme for a second, to me, <laughs> our beliefs, past experiences, our political views, et cetera, all serve as filters through which we experience and make sense of the world that's around us. When we think about data, these metaphorical filters are especially important because A, there's far too much data for us to consume and make sense of logically, and B, most of the time, importantly, someone else is deciding what data we see and how we see that data. So with that in mind, there are two important filters to consider that I wanna share with you when we think about the data that we're exposed to. First, since most of us see data through news outlets and online media, including social media, media voice certainly has an impact on our understanding. All media, despite active attempts at, at trying to be objective, have a perspective or a voice through which they speak. And that voice is informed by a number of things, by political leanings, 
That voice is informed by the ownership of that media outlet. That voice is informed by the news anchors and the writers and the other people that are involved in its production. What's important is that the decisions that are being made by a news outlet or a media source about what to show its viewers, what to show us, is shaped by that voice. I think most people would agree, especially in the past number of weeks and months, that following the US presidential election on CNN versus Fox News is a very different experience of supposedly the exact same thing. <clears throat> the same is true for the coverage of COVID-19 in different ways, but in very similar ways at the same time, where the media outlet, the media outlets that we're exposed to, be they traditional, be they social media, be they a conversation that we're having uh, with somebody uh, at our workplace or, or other setting, those media filters, those media sources filter what we experience by their choice of what data to share and how to share it. Second, and from my perspective, more importantly, there's a recognition that we sometimes filter our own experiences. Sometimes we, we actively make an effort whether we're aware of it or not, to look for data that supports or confirms our own beliefs or ideas. This well-documented phenomenon is called confirmation bias. So if I hold the belief that COVID cases are out of control in the province of Ontario, my brain will actively look for data that supports that claim and even potentially downplay other data or evidence that might challenge it. This is something that happens without our conscious attention and can really shape the way that we experience and interpret the information that surrounds us and that's being presented to us. These two filters are of course related and together they add another layer of complexity to how we interpret our experience and in particular, how we interpret the data that we're being presented. But simply even being aware of these two filters, simply being aware that they exist and that they can impact the way that we understand what's around us can help us both feel and be better informed. In closing, I want to come back to and leave you with the two simple yet incredibly powerful ideas about data. The ways in which we select and represent data both matter. And as we saw, can influence our experiences and the conclusions that we draw. With the volume of data that comes our way daily during this COVID-19 pandemic, the importance of these two ideas becomes heightened, especially during a health crisis where we crave both knowledge and certainty. Thank you so much for your attention and for the opportunity to speak with you tonight, to have you join us here tonight. And I'm happy now to turn things over to Mrs. Rena Deutsch for our next talk. Okay, sorry for the technical difficulties there. <laughs> okay, um, Morty, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, my talk is gonna go in a bit of a different direction because I'm going to be talking about the effect of COVID on the community and sort of the broader Jewish community, both in Toronto and outside. Now, I remember Friday, March 13th, very, very clearly. There were charts and graphs sort of similar to what Morty just presented to us and lots and lots of talk about flattening the curve as the administration announced the two week shutdown of school just so that the healthcare system wouldn't get overwhelmed and we'd be back to school after Pesach. Well, that was the longest Pesach vacation in history. As those two weeks stretched into a month and then another month and then another, what started off sounding sort of like a fun two weeks home with you know pajama bottoms and work tops um, it turned into something much much more serious and difficult for all of us beyond the panic and the fear and the toilet paper and hand sanitizer shortages shuls closed their doors for prayer and learning alike and batim midrash fell silent Families that didn't live together couldn't be together for the sadarim and other simchas unless it was outdoors two meters apart and with fewer than 10 people, which didn't really leave many options, especially with the Canadian weather. 
Weddings needed to be postponed because brides or grooms couldn't make it across the border. And the weddings that did take place in those early days saw Chatanim and Kalot walking down the aisles without their parents by their sides. Five people in one backyard, five people in another backyard, and the rabbi and the adim standing six feet apart in different directions away from the chuppah. There were no simchas chatam v'kala, there was no dancing, there were no sheva brachot. It was a totally different world. Bar mitzvah boys, like my own son, who became bar mitzvah in mid-May, didn't get called up to the Torah. No aliyah, no davening for the amud, no party. Schools went online and children of all ages missed the routine of going to school, their friends and their teachers and actual in-person instruction, which just can't be substituted over Zoom. And teachers missed the interaction and the energy that we get from our students. High school seniors and eighth grade students didn't get to finish their last year of school together to finish making those memories that they would never have a chance to recreate. And graduations were radically different. Although I have to say that B'nai Akiva schools drive-in graduation was actually pretty cool. Going to the grocery store became something akin to like mission impossible because you had to try to not stand too close to the next shopper and you didn't want to touch anything that you weren't going to actually take. And you were worrying the whole time about how long can this virus actually exist and sustain itself on this box of Cheerios or my can of peas or the bag of apples. And do I need to disinfect everything before I bring it into the house? People lost jobs and financial security overnight, worrying about how to cover all their expenses and continue paying for bills. They had to try to figure out how to work from home, which I can speak from personal experience, isn't always so easy. There was lagging internet. Trust me, the struggle is real on that one. And there were kids in the house 24 seven. It really wasn't so simple. Now, while thank God things have certainly improved from those first few weeks, or at least we've gotten more used to things, so that they seem better, there's no question that COVID has affected our lives as individuals and as a community. And while much of what we've experienced has been significantly challenging, it's worthwhile to note the bright spots and the resilience that our community has been showing. The American Psychological Association defines resilience as the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, and other significant sources. When you think about it, we Jews are pretty much all about resilience. We've experienced countless tragedies, traumas, and catastrophes, yet we've survived and even thrived on both the micro and macro levels. Jewish history is a recurring cycle of crisis and recovery dating back to Gan Eden, or even to the time of Avram Avinu that we'll be reading in this week's Parsha, where they encountered a famine and had to think on their feet of what they were going to do. In fact, when he, one of our many monikers as a nation is B'nai Israel, so-called Kisarisa im Elokim v'im anashim v'tuchal, because you have struggled with God and with man and prevailed. The Malach of Esav gave Yaakov Avinu this name after their epic showdown beside the river in which Yaakov fought the angel all night long, refusing to let him go back to Shemaim without bestowing a blessing on him, on Yaakov, before going. And he was named specifically for the struggle rather than the victory, which theoretically would have made more sense and probably sounded maybe a little bit better, to teach us that the ability to withstand the struggle is within our spiritual DNA. And the name both includes spiritual and physical struggles in Ishvi, in Elohim, with man and with God, which can tell us that we're able to be victorious both in both types of struggles, but also that we can use both spiritual and the physical to combat anything. We should for sure be following the Ministry of Health's guidelines, as the Torah tells us, but we should also make sure to dive in for the cholim and to say an extra capital of Tehillim. We should use every tool in our toolbox, both the spiritual and the physical ones. It's as if the angel gave Yaakov the name Resilience, which then became one of our names as a nation. Through this whole ordeal, as challenging, as uncomfortable as it's been, there really have been bright spots. The amount of Torah learning that took place online globally grew exponentially with rabbis and rebbitzins and lay Torah leaders uploading incredible shiurim of Torah and chizuk on every platform imaginable. 
The community rallied around those who needed help setting up personal grocery shoppers for people who had to avoid the stores for risk of exposure. Chesed initiatives to call people who couldn't make it out were created. Facebook groups where people were offering resources of time and material to one another. I'm going to the store. Is there anything that you need? What can I do to help you? Different charitable organizations stepped in to help Jewish nonprofits stay afloat as best they could, and other areas of tzedakah grew as well. Even here at B'nai Akiva schools, we stepped in to help keep the students' spirits up by starting the morning inspiration emails that went out every morning with a little Dvar Torah or some message of hope and strength to keep that feeling of our school community going strong, even when we couldn't be together in person. As a community, we have always worked at help, helping people to get on with life in the face of challenge and pain. There are certain maxims or sayings that we have as Jews that help us with our resilience and ability to keep going despite the challenge and pain. Gamzulatova, this too is for the best, is something we often say, and it has an underlying implication that something good will become apparent, either is or will become apparent. This is what we say when we're looking for those silver linings or obviously positive things that can come out of something that at very least on the surface can be perceived as bad. And there's this really amazing story that came out of Lakewood after Pesach. There was a woman who was living alone and wasn't going to be able to be with her family for Pesach the way she normally would be. And the family who lived next door to her felt so badly about it, they wanted to invite her to come to them for the Seder. So what they said to her was, we have a window on the side of our house that slides onto you and you have a window that slides onto us. So we'll push our dining room table over to the window. You push your dining room table over to the window. We'll leave the windows open. And that way we can be together for the Sadarim. Now the woman, they all, they did this and the woman had such a lovely time at this, the Sadarim and she was so grateful and thankful to this family that she was be able to be included in their singing and the Divrei Torah and the discussion so that even if she was at home alone in her house, she wasn't really alone. And she was actually even more thrilled that her neighbors had all the same tunes that she and her family normally sang. After Yom Tov, when she was speaking to her daughter, she mentioned this to her and her daughter said to her, Ma, your neighbors called me two weeks ago and they had me teach them the tunes. And the neighbors had been practicing them ever since to make sure that this woman who was going to be alone without her family would be able to have a beautiful, comfortable Pesach that kind of felt like home. And now just over Rosh Hashanah, it's actually possible that more Jews than ever heard Shofar in Thornhill, even if they didn't actually mean to. There were so many community shofar blowings that were set up at in parks and in backyards and at street corners. My husband was part of the shofar exchange program for the Bayat. He had offered to go blow shofar for anyone from the Kehillah who wasn't able to make it out to hear it elsewhere. He decided on Tisha B'Av that he better start practicing just in case. And as we were walking down Clark Avenue to go to the conservatory where he was going to be blowing for a woman who wasn't able to leave her apartment, we heard so many different shofars coming from backyards up and down the street. It was so special. And then on our way home, when we were just outside our house, there was another one at the corner of our street. It was incredible. Now, Gamzula Tova, look at all the good that has come out of bad. And we have another saying, Kol manza avid rachmana letav avid. Everything that the merciful one does is done for the good. The implication here is that the event itself doesn't present anything that can be perceived as good, but we know that there has to be good in there somewhere that perhaps only Hashem can see. So all the loss, the loss of life, the financial loss, the time we could have spent together as families and as a community, we can't necessarily perceive the good of any of it. We don't get it. We can't get it. And we probably never will get it. And this is where our amuna, our trust in Hashem needs to come in to help us get through. And as Jews, we search to find meaning in all of it, even in the hardest circumstances, a lesson to learn so that it's not all for nothing. And the sons of Rebbe in Netanya, Rebbe Tzvi Elimelech Halberstam, despite adhering very, very carefully to all the health guidelines in Israel, contracted COVID just before Rosh Hashanah, and he was required to be in complete quarantine over the Yom and Narayim. Before Sukkot, he addressed his followers and anyone else who would listen on a public broadcast. And he suggested that perhaps one thing we can learn from the isolation we've experienced 
and that Israel just experienced again with their latest seger with their shutdown, which just ended, is how important togetherness really is, not just as friends and family, but as of the Jewish people. He said, quote, a positive attitude is lacking and peace does not prevail between one person and the next. Instead of seeing only good and judging each person favorably, we gossip and slander. He continued, you wanna put others at a distance and live only for yourself? So go into isolation only with yourself. He was able to take a lesson for all of us out of this, for us to remember how important it is to be together. Baruch Hashem, there really have been many stories of the community coming together, but we kind of have to make sure that it stays that way. We can certainly disagree with some people, the way they're dealing with things or reacting, but ultimately we need to remember that we are one nation, one people. After Akidat Yitzchak, Hashem blessed Avraham Avinu that his children would be numerous, to be like the, the sand, the, pardon me, that he, they would be like the stars of the sky and the sand on the seashore. So to be like the stars, that makes sense. They're, they're bright, and they're shiny, each one is unique. They light up the night sky, they draw people's attention heavenward. So that, that makes sense, I'm good with that. But the sand, it sounds a little lowly to be honest, people just walk all over that. But there's actually something very powerful to be learned here. One grain of sand on its own isn't really that much and it would easily get swept away by the tide, but all those little grains of sand together are strong and are able to withstand even the strongest, hardest, most pounding waves. When we come together as a community to support each other in any way we can, in the ways that we have been and the ways that we have yet to do, we will be comforted by at least knowing that our community will come out of this perhaps a little different, but definitely still intact, connected to Hashem and to one another. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll just take it from here. Um, first of all, thank you, Morty and Arena, for, uh, for everything you said. Um, I doubt I'll be able to match that level of eloquence, but I'll do my best. Um, so I'll be speaking tonight about uh, specifically COVID's um, impact on the self, specifically more from the, the mental health perspective. Um, and because I'm a school social worker primarily, uh, most of the data I have had access to and that I've um, been interacting with is from the perspective of adolescents. That being said, um, it is a very good place to start whenever we're discussing anything um, regarding self-care and mental health because adolescence is essentially the point in our lives when we really start discovering who we are as people and who we want to be as adults. Um, we tend to experiment a lot with the social context. We rely on a lot of our social interactions and our mentors to develop that sense of self that will shape who we are and the kinds of um, the kinds of uh, strategies that we implement later on to deal with things. Um, so we take a lot of adolescents take cues on who they want to be, how they act, or how they will act, and what they want to do with the rest of their lives from everyone. And this comes out in a need for increased control over their environments, as well as a immense drive to develop their own sense of self, um, which is why routines are so important for teenagers and for adults, um, because for teens, it creates a structure and a foundation um, that is consistent um, so that they know what the expectations are of them, and then they can ex further experiment with their environments and uh, learn new and healthy ways to interact. It also happens to the rich, the routines happen to contain all the coping mechanisms and the strategies that we usually use to resolve conflict in our lives and the strategies that we use to deal with difficult things that come up. This is also why teens tend to push back on their routines because they are trying to control more and to adjust their routines to meet the needs of their environments. All of these routines and the consistency and reliability that the teens thrive on 
grows and develops into who we are later on in life and becomes um, the foundations of our adult lives. Um, and further uh, digging into that a bit, the mental health concerns that a lot of us will deal with over time either develop or are already present during adolescence. They've come out of either genetic um, predispositions or environmental factors that create them. And that is when we start to learn how to deal with those uh, issues and how we start to learn how to um, adapt to our environments and just get to know ourselves in that way. COVID-19 when it hit, as we I'm sure all remember, um, primarily impacted our social structures and our routines. Uh, it came with a need to quarantine and social distance. We didn't see most of the people we're used to seeing. We didn't get to do most of the things we are used to doing. And it really just breaks down the fundamentals that we just went through that teens and adults rely on. Um, essentially, individuals have a completely changed routine. Uh, they don't know what to expect. Um, we don't really have the coping strategies that we're used to. So if you were someone who used uh, exercise to deal with stress, suddenly gyms are closed and you can't do that. Uh, for our children who rely on extracurricular activities or adults who rely on hobbies to deal with the stresses of the day, oftentimes those were impacted and you couldn't get access to the resources or the places or the people you needed to do that. And the general people that you rely on for emotional and social support, other than your immediate family, in, off, in most cases, like friends and mentors and everyone else, were suddenly at a loss as to both how to keep in contact and how to support other people or themselves. In addition to all that, uh, being stuck at home, as has been said before tonight, is a difficult, uh, one, if you have a family around you, not because we don't love our families, not because we don't want to be around them a lot, but because oftentimes as people who are trying to individuate from that context, who have our own identities, who have our lives, we are brought back into the complex interactions of those relationships that can sometimes bring things up that have not been a problem or that we can otherwise escape from. Um, especially having some time, you know, that you can get other things done when kids are not omnipresent, when you're not trying to balance work and life in the exact same environment, all of those factors tend to coalesce into one location and it just becomes very difficult to maintain that work-life balance uh, in the COVID environment. From a self perspective, from the perspective of um, especially what we've been seeing with our students and with our families. The first interesting statistic and, and result that we've seen over the past few months is that a lot of individuals have migrated to an increasingly online social context. Um, those were, who were heavily invested in it for their routines and coping strategies found that transition to be less disruptive and an easier uh, transition to make. Um, especially for our students and our children who oftentimes will use uh, social media and the virtual environment to do the vast majority of their social interactions. Um, so that, that was an easier transition while people who are very minimally engaged in the virtual environments um, who did have to transition, especially those of us and myself included who are not as Zoom um, handy who couldn't necessarily navigate those initial uh, transitions to the technologies that we're now very, uh, very familiar with, have found it more disruptive. Um, similarly, people who rely on impersonal socialization who, or who find, found themselves in that context naturally, especially our students who just went back to school or people who have gone back to jobs or who continue to be in jobs, um, have generally reported a, a greater struggle maintaining COVID boundaries. And those boundaries tend to break down faster uh, in those people than everyone else. Most of that is because of the way we're used to socialize and the way we're used to interacting. Part of that, especially when it comes to our students is peer pressure, 
um, and general uh, belief, unfortunately, in their um, invulnerability in many respects. Uh, students, especially who have been asked why they're acting in this way and breaking down those boundaries pretty quickly, um, have expressed beliefs that center around uh, their very low risk of any negative impacts of COVID-19. They tend to struggle to conceptualize the reality of the risk of passing it on to others or the, the real statistics that have been out there. Um, and they tend to focus more as teenagers do uh, on their own invulnerability and just lack of consequences that they can foresee. Um, another trend that we've been seeing in this way has been for those who are engaged in social media um, and uh, tend to get a lot of their information from there, there has been a massive amount of misinformation or misunderstood information within that context that exists out there that have played a prominent role in why people act in a certain way toward COVID attitudes and the general social distancing um, criteria, I guess, or strategy. Um, taking a step back from the general social context to a more mental health point of view, uh, we've been seeing an interesting split in the population uh, from across mental health um, contexts. People who have already experienced underlying risks or have a history of things like depression and anxiety um, have experienced a drastic ex exacerbation of the symptoms. They tend to be struggling a lot more. They tend to need a lot more support. Um, this is primarily due to the loss of routine and the coping strategies that are usually embedded in them. The people you're used to relying on to help you navigate them, the strategies you're, you're used to using to avoid those symptoms. Um, that being said, individuals who have not had those risk factors, who generally tend to be normative in their functioning or who just have not experienced them yet in some contexts have tended to not thrive, but function even better. And in some cases uh, to do better in this context because of the much more rigid routine and much more um, structured day and structured um, schedule, I guess you could say, that comes with uh, the later half of these months that we've been in COVID. Um, that being said, specifically when it's come to those who have been struggling, a lot of reports have indicated an increase in anxiety and stress-related phenomena. Um, even in the most basic sense, more complaints of headaches, gastrointestinal distress, and insomnia and behaviors related to insomnia, a lot of screen time use or inability to sleep, uh, while Others with the more depressive symptoms have been seeing the classic signs of increased feelings of hopelessness, low affect and mood, excessive sleeping, um, and a lower threshold, especially in teens, toward more behavioral concerns and uh, sudden panics. Um, in addition, unfortunately, uh, according to most sources, individuals uh, who have experienced substance abuse concerns in the past um, have been reported to have experienced a lot more relapses during COVID. And our, our community and our, our teens and our children are not immune to this. In some cases, especially around times of the Jewish holidays and other times of social gatherings are common in the secular community, Thanksgiving and um, other weekends or Victoria Day weekends and uh, national holidays, we're seeing a lot of excessive use of alcohol, nicotine, marijuana, and other more um, severe substances. To summarize, COVID has been a very interesting time for the vast majority of us. Um, from a self standpoint, it has attacked pretty much the foundational fundamental um, routines and habits that we rely on to be able to get through our days, to be able to function as uh, you know, adults and people in society. Those of us who, who do struggle, and, it, and there are many of us who do struggle with these concerns, have seen uh, an increase in all those issues and, and 
thankfully there have been many um, increases in resources to help deal with those things, especially when it comes to um, government run uh, clinics and just generally um, a lot of therapists and mental health professionals have been doing their best to get increased supports into the community. Um, those of us who don't suffer as much or don't have as many concerns, according to most statistics, have um, found it a bit easier to navigate. And while it's never easy, um, it has certainly been an easier transition, especially those who have um, increased knowledge or increased experience with uh, the virtual environment and those social contexts. And finally, um, especially when it comes to substance abuse and other related abuse disorders, um, it has certainly been a, a very big struggle, especially with a lack of the routines that those people rely on to keep themselves safe and keep themselves healthy. And it has unfortunately been a very tough time to be people, you know, as normal people are with our various needs. Um, I think I've lost the screen here. Uh, thank you all. Uh, and I'll pass it back off to Morty uh, for some closing words. Annie, thank you so much. Uh, it, it's clear from the from the three talks tonight that uh, th this is a this is a, an unprecedented time, a time of change, uh, and it's it's during these times in particular that that discussions, that discourse, that uh, reflecting on on what we've been going through over this time and continue to go through uh, because this is still very much a a, a present and evolving situation that we find ourselves in. Uh, those kind of activities are incredibly important. Uh, and it's it's with that that I'll share a couple of quick thank yous. Um, first, a thank you to our to our, our, our speakers tonight, to Mrs. Rina Deutsch, to Mr. Tani Rees for preparing talks and for, for presenting to the group uh, uh, this evening. Uh, a big thank you to the wonderful group that we've had join us here uh, tonight uh, to uh, uh, share in this in this uh, uh, presentation and these presentations, uh, and to 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 benefit from the uh, from the varied experiences uh, and perspectives uh, of our uh, of our speakers tonight. Uh, I want to thank as well uh, our development office team, uh, which is an incredible team within the school uh, that you know uh, takes on a variety of projects here in the in the building. Many times behind the scenes, and many times without a lot of fanfare. Uh, but uh, uh, it's evenings like this and events like this that they they have a, a tremendous hand in shaping and making happen. Uh, we are we're strengthened. We say this many many times, and we're going to keep saying it because it's it's a powerful message. Um, we're we're strengthened as a community when we come together, when we act as a collective, uh, and when we uh, support one another. Um, uh, engaging in activities like this is one form of that. Uh, so with that, thank you for joining us. Uh, I encourage you to check out uh, our our upcoming uh, sessions as well. There will be two other sessions that are planned. Um, for the for the coming uh, uh, weeks and months, uh, please be on the lookout for a uh, an email from uh, from our school about that. Um, wishing you and your loved ones only good health. Uh, keep safe, keep healthy, and we look forward to the next opportunity to see you. Thank you. Have a wonderful night.